these guys who's, for being who's early. Doing the intro. Okay. Wait. Uh, are we gonna do the physical prep beatbox intro? <laughs> Rufus. Rufus, hit that beat. <laughs> beep beep. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> You're on, Bill. <laughs> uh, hey guys, just before Bill goes on, just general rules. Uh, mute your thing if you're not talking, because then we don't get the echo and it sounds better. Who's got a first question? Steven. Oh, you know Bill I got opening you know remarks. Got... <laughs> Who's gonna win, Mayweather or the other guy, the Irish guy? McGregor. <laughs> yeah, that's the name. I think we all know who's going to win. <laughs> um, and let me let me just say this: that Conor McGregor is going to win, um, whether he wins or loses the fight, because he's going to make hundred million dollars, and he'll walk away at age twenty-seven as a gajillionaire. So, you know. But moving on to more serious things, Stephen, go ahead and start your first question there, young man. Um. Uh. I guess one of my biggest questions is where do you see people go wrong with applying PRI mostly? You know, when people bring patients into you, what do the other practitioners typically miss? Uh, in terms um, it's of an incredibly simple answer. Um, they fail miserably at establishing a zone of opposition yeah. for the uh, thoracic diaphragm. 100%. It's the, it is the most consistently negligent component that they apply. Yes. Um, and I, and I, I think it's just a matter of people not understanding what needs to be done to actually achieve it. And, and so they fall short. Um, and I'm trying to think back. It's been so long since I really thought about this kind of thing. As to, um, how we went about... Um, establishing some methodology in that regard but uh um i think it was it's just a, a a little bit of an evolution the fact that we had everybody going to a whole lot of courses all at once at the very beginning of things um and maybe got m more repeat exposure to different instruction and coming back and then a lot of discussion um, amongst ourselves and and demonstrations about how we're doing things and what we're doing and what outcomes are we getting but uh you know and i'll i'll, I'll get referral I'll, I'll people come from out of state um and they'll have seen like a prc who is someone that is supposed to be you know um skilled yeah. at, at a certain level and um you know i'll talk them through um just something as simple as an exhalation and it will all come as a total surprise to them um, in regards to, to what I'm asking them to do. And then to demonstrate the changes in outcomes. So people will send, send me a patient that appears to be, a, as we call a zebra, um, so where they think that they got something weird going on, like they, maybe they got goofy feet or goofy teeth or goofy eyes. And it turns out that they just didn't complete an exhale the entire treatment that they were seen by the other therapist. And, and, you know, it, it, it's such a simple concept, but therein lies the power of, you know, using respiration to manipulate the variability of the entire system. But you have to be able to exhale in the first place. And, and so a long answer um, to a simple, simple question, but, uh, but that's, that would be it. What are the things that you look for to, you know, ensure that they achieve the full exhalation, you know, the buteco breathing, and is there any kind of physical cues that you're looking for outside of the test changing? Yeah, um, so if you've ever palpated a, a left rib cage as somebody exhales, um, you, know, you, can, you can sort of feel the drop off when you, when you sort of achieve the, the appropriate diaphragm position of exhalation. Um, but if you think about sort of the shape of the abdomen in a, in a position of full exhalation, where you sort of have this continuity between the rib cage and the abdomen and, and the, 
the the torso becomes very cylindrical if if that makes sense um it, if if i can deviate just a little bit this is a distinguishing character characteristic between people that need a manual technique versus somebody that doesn't need a manual technique is when somebody can exhale fully and they do achieve this sort of cylindrical shape to the to the torso they don't need a manual technique yeah. they, they're they're achieving the appropriate rib cage position for exhalation okay um and so then it's something else um, whereas if you have somebody that is in a hyperinflated state and they don't even get close to what you would consider that that uh, position, then you know that you're going to have to provide a sensory input that they can't generate themselves. And that's usually when you re require a manual technique to, to the ribcage, whatever your methodology may be, you know, from any osteopathic background or PT background or, or whatever. Um, like I said, whatever your choice of methodology is. Yeah, I think that's what kind of what happened with one of the patients that I was seeing where he'd kind of fake me out in terms of, you know, making it look like the rib cage came down, but he'd actually just push his stomach forward so that it would yeah. uh, on the exhale so everything would look flat. But when he'd actually, um, you know, try to get that cylindrical shape, there was no way he could get his ribs down, um, you know, on his own. Yeah, so just, it, just like for the continuity between the rib cage and the, and the abdomen more than anything else. And, it, it, if, and if you see like a depression in, in the abs, mm -hmm. um, you, you don't have it. <laughs> yeah. You have lumbar any, flexion, right? Any, any specific manual techniques that you tend to go to first or? You know what's be, be as simple as possible. Just shove a left rib cage down. And, yeah. and literally create a manual zone of that position first. It cleans up a lot of good stuff. Um, just hold it. Just hold it there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like we don't really have to be complicated. So, so if you start thinking some of this stuff through, um, if you understand how air moves through the thorax and how pressure is controlled in the abdomen and in the pelvis, um, you can kind of tweak the rib cage position manually. Um, with some really simple sensory contacts. I mean, just, you don't have to um, um, be terribly creative to, to put pressure on one side of the sternum compared to the other side to, to make it rotate in the other direction, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, you don't have to be terribly creative to make sure that the left rib cage comes down or the right rib cage under some circumstances, right? So if you got a bilaterally extended client then you need to bring both sides of that down you know mm -hmm. if you're a trainer and you can't use a manual technique that's why we have glute ham raises right yeah. so we just use the glute ham bench and we just lamb over that and then we can create the same thing we don't have to touch anybody we can direct the airflow anywhere we want the, the the thing you have to understand is like okay where where does the air go where do i want it to go and then how do i create resistance to make the air go where it's not right mm -hmm. so you know, I, I can direct it anyway. You can use a bench. You can use a Swiss ball. You can use anything when you lay people over these, these you know, objects that you can redirect the airflow to the apex of the lung. You can, you can redirect it to the posterior mediastinum. You don't have to be able to push it with your hands. You just got to understand where the air is and where it needs to go. It, it, this will be my last follow-up. Is it? Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> any, any place you'd put pressure, for example, to like, drive more into the apex versus posterior mediastinum. So, okay. So, so you have to understand a little bit about airflow, right? So we have, we have gravitational issues and then we have mobility related issues that create paths of least resistance. Okay. So the lower part of the lung is typically more full. Um, because of gravity, if we're upright, we tend to, it makes it easier to move air into the lower part of the lung. So gravity works, right? And it pushes the air down into the lower part of the lung. And so th that area is going to be more perfused with, with blood. Um, and, and so it makes a nice little exchange there. Um, because of the, the bucket handle effect uh, of the lower rib cage, it's, it's also an easier place to get air in. So the lower anterior rib cage tends to be the place where the, the greatest path of uh, the, the path of least resistance lies. Right. So if I need to push the air back, 
um, then I, I don't want to have somebody laying on their back because it makes it very, very difficult to do. However, if I have them laying on their back and I resist the lower anterior rib cage, guess where the air is going to go? I don't really have much, many other options. However, however, um, I also need to be careful that it do doesn't go down and forward, right? So, so that's where the abdominals come into play and pelvic position comes into play because I have to have a pelvic diaphragm positioned appropriately, right? To create enough resistance of intra-abdominal pressure. So if I see a belly that's pooching out, so mm -hmm. um, we were just talking about that a little bit ago. Um, if I see somebody's belly pooching out, then I know that, okay, the path of least resistance is now below my point of contact, below the rib cage. And so I'm just caving, you know, I'm, I'm sort of collapsing the upper rib cage, right? There's too much pressure in the upper rib cage relative to the abdominal cavity. And so then I lose the pressure to the abdominal cavity. So mm -hmm. then again, so now I got to play with pelvic position. I got to make sure I have intact abdominals. Um, and, and then maybe I can redirect the airflow upwards, right? So I can't just rely on my manual contacts. I have to have, I have, to have positions. I have to have muscle activity intact in, in as well. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. else got a follow-up uh, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah well, kind of following on that same question i guess like where do you see that breakdown occur do you see it in let me break down someone going through and finding that position do you see it in queuing that people push through it or people progress someone too quickly like is there is there a general statement or is it kind of case specific or um kind of an all of the above honestly um you can change so much by what you say and, and I think that there's, a, there's probably a lot of people that, that just really don't know how to direct um, an exercise appropriately. And this is something that, that I've seen in my students. Um, but, but here's the difference. So the, the guys that have come through our program um, as, as gym interns first, they become great coaches in, in four months. They get a lot of uh, direction. They get a lot of experience. They get a lot of time on the floor, and they become great coaches. Those kids that go to PT school and then come back as students are loaded for bear. And it's not just because that they've been through our system before. It's because they've got a lot of coaching experience. And so I'll see the same thing. So if um, so I had a, a kid from, uh, oh, gosh, where was Josh from? San Jose. Is that right? San Jose? Northern California. And, um, yeah, and he had worked as a personal trainer um, for a, a few years before he went to PT school. And um, um, he had a lot of that going for him as well in regards to his ability to communicate. He was a smart kid. He was like the Valley Victorian. So he's a smart kid. But, um, but he'd already spent a lot of t long time developing a lot of those relationships um, in working one-on-one -on -one with people. And so his ability to pick up on, on cues and instructions is much better. And I think a lot of students don't have that. It's, it's like one of those things that you would think would come out in the interview process as kids are going through school, but I don't think it does. Yeah, or there are or clinical internships, it seems like. Hey, what now? Or like during the clinical internship, it's like the hands-on experience. But. You know, and, and, and I don't take first clinical at all. Right. I, I, I make it very clear that if you're, if I'm your first clinical, you don't want to be with me. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, seriously, I, I, cause I did it once and I'll never do it again. Um, just because of the, the degree of preparation was so poor and, and it just became a battle and a struggle. And it's the only time I've ever had to call the school and say, look, this kid's in trouble, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, you know, I just think that the, the, the coaching element, I mean, you know, physical therapists are supposed to be these extra experts in exercise, and, and I would say that there's very little of that. Well, that was weird. Did you ever get that feedback? Um, but anyway, but anyway. Uh, so, so, you know, if you go back, back to your original question, I, I think that, the, you know, it, 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 it probably starts with what you say, um, and then what you say is dependent on what you know. 
And, and if you, if you go to a course and the first thing you do is you say, Oh, this is really cool. This is really awesome. I, I think this is what I, how I'm going to treat people. And then you don't have enough of a background, then you're stuck. Right. Cause now you, you're, you're a one trick pony and you've got three, three techniques and you've only heard the, the exercise described one time and then you're scrambling. So a lot of people don't know what to say. And they, so they might say that, that I, I do my three letter acronym treatment. Right. Um, and the reality is they just don't know enough to say the right things and to do the right things, even whether they're credentialed by that system or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it kind of, the question I had come in here, segues perfect seg segues uh, segues perfectly into, into that and i'm imagining it's a question that everyone here probably hears a lot but in my experience with the pri coursework the exercise kind of prescription and organization and progression regression it's so like it's so voluminous and there's so much um that what i've done i kind of feel on one hand like i'm a little guilty of what you're talking about where i'm like okay what are the ones that make sense to me what are the ones i like Right. And I just kind of stick with those because as soon as I get in the book, I'm like, there's a million bazillion. I'm, I know people have asked this question before, like what, maybe how, maybe my question is that I always had, what what's up? How do you know what to do? Yeah. How do you know what to do? Yeah. That, that's, that's why I, I kind of like DNS because with DNS, it's just like, Oh, like it, to me, it kind of has more of a flow, like, like yoga. I suppose the PRI is just, it's kind of, um, uh, paralysis by options you know that's that's my but, yeah i mean i i, I see your point but the, but it's not yeah. all right um so i have a very specific um way that i initiate treatment based on a few simple principles yeah. you want to turn it off campo <laughs> all right but um so with 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 just a few tests. Mm -hmm. um, I could I could tell you like based on where they can control pressure in the thorax, how they control pressure in the abdomen. Um, I could narrow it down probably to within three exercises what you would start with. Yeah. Um, and then the tree just you know it, you start with like a small number of exercises at the apex, and then the tree goes out. But a, a lot of it depends on um the the needs and then the complexity right so you always start simple and the the exercises organized in such a way um very much like a developmental uh progression mm -hmm. um if you if you if you attend to that right so um but but i would i would agree with you that the way that they're taught in the courses is is um leaving a lot on the table for a lot of people to mistakes because there is no direction to it and the assumption is is that um they're, they're they're not all that different and they are different um but you know it took a while to, to sort of figure out the best um process but it took a lot of study outside of those courses actually to uh determine what would be the best case um, if you're familiar with DNS and you and you and you know PNF at all, um, those are the the basic principles. I mean, you use like a developmental kinesiology progression. You can you can achieve the same thing as long as you know where you need to make the change in in pressure control, right? Because um, that's all those exercises are anyway. It's for that what what I see in all of those exercises, whether we're talking about um, the, the DNS stuff or PRI stuff or whatever, it's just PNF to me. It all looks exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, it's very similar. Yeah. Sorry, my internet cut out there for a second. It's all right. But, but um, yeah, thank you for that. Do you, I mean, because that, that's what I kind of feel like I'm guilty of. Not guilty, but, you know, a couple of years ago, luckily I have a client base that was private training with me, so I was able to experiment on them right. with PRI stuff. But I would hope that... Um, you know, we can exploit that learning curve. So some of the mistakes that I've, you know, made with people, which are just, you know, little short-term mistakes, some discomfort here and there from being a little bit too aggressive. Right. Um, I'm just kind of, I've always wondered how I can streamline that and, you know, just kind of make it, what, what I do right now is, is kind of just keep it simple and just have, it's almost generic. That's why I'm worried. I'm worried I'm getting like too generic. I wonder if I should add in more variety. Well, but I, 
see, uh, and again, this is this is this is me talking and having spent a lot of time in one room, <laughs> yeah. you know, where where I work and in in isolation and being able to make a few mistakes and then um, learning more. Uh, you have to spend time outside of these courses, understanding the mechanics of of the axial skeleton. You have to understand the 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 way that pressure changes inside the thorax and in the abdomen and inside the pelvis. And if you can understand those, then your your treatment becomes very very targeted, and your your exercise selection becomes very very narrowed. Okay, I mean it, it's it. If, if you buy the DVDs or you look in some of the mails and you just get overwhelmed with all these exercises, like, why would I use this one? Why would I use this one? Why would I use this? And there's very specific reasons to use all of them. I will assure you of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, to, 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 it's probably beyond the scope of an hour long call yeah. to uh, be able to, to offer you like a specific suggestion. But here's what I would say um, um, from a, a very simple perspective. Um, diaphragm rules, thoracic diaphragm rules. So that position has to come first, yeah. right? There are, there are several types of thoraxes that will, that will influence how that diaphragm is positioned and that determines what your first exercise will be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, Cause not all pelvises are the same. So if I have a bilateral extension pattern, there are several types of bilateral extension patterns. Yeah which all require a different exercise selection. While if you apply the same exercise across the board for somebody that's a bilateral, you might see some changes. You, you won't get the big bang that, you, that you'll get if you pick the right exercise. Yeah, yeah. Okay? So, um, you know, um, so let's, let's use an example. So somebody that, so Stephen, pay attention. I'm talking about wide infrasternal angles now. Okay. <laughs> if I have a wide infrasternal angle, mm -hmm. that is a very specific rib cage shape. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which means that the diaphragm is in a very, very specific type of position. Mm -hmm. All right. So under those circumstances, one of your best choices to make is to do an exercise where the, whoops, sorry. Sorry about that. One of the best choices um, is to do an activity where the arms are above shoulder level. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, for, and for, for various reasons, but, but exhaling against that position with the arms overhead does many good things in regards to a lot of the muscles that attach to the thorax. And as far as the abdominal recruitment that, that are required to restore the diaphragm position, because it's not, it's not the IOs and TAs like everybody wants to talk about. Um, in fact, so when you have a wide infrasternal angle, you need external obliques to be recruited to close the infrasternal angle. Because if you, if you try to recruit IOs and TAs with a wide infrasternal angle, you make it wider. Um, you know, like I said, you'll get some changes in your test, but, but they won't be full and they won't stick. Um, so, you know, like, so if I was going to start like a, a, a fitness client that had, that I knew had a wide infrasternal angle, so wider than 90 degrees would be considered wide, right? Um, grab them and just put them on a lat hang or something like that. By the way, lat hang, a misnomer entirely. We'll talk about that at another call sometime, okay? That was an um, awesome video though, Lance. Lance, thank you for that video. Good video. <laughs> what video is that? No, he has like the lat, I actually sent it to all my clients him with the balloon lat hang. Oh, I'm, I'm honored. I'm they honored. Cue it, cue it money, it's beautiful. <laughs> Cody, Cody Ben's the star of that one. Oh yeah. yeah. Was that when you had the tie on and everything? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, the tie on. <laughs> yeah. That's how that's how Lance dresses to work at iFest. Uh -huh. yeah. I gotta make up for everything else. Yeah. There you go. Um so so but again, like I said, there's there's favorable things with the arms overhead and then there's favorable things for all fours, which mm -hmm. so so when I have a narrow infrastructure angle, so an infrastructure angle that's narrower than ninety degrees, I always go to all fours first, assuming they can support their body weight. Yeah. Because not, not a lot of those, those skinny folk with the narrow infrastructure angles can, can do it all for us really, really well. But that would be the ideal position for that. And again, I'm, I'm thinking diaphragm position first. Um, and and uh, the type of recruitment that you need to actually change the shape of the rib cage to put the diaphragm in a respiratory position. Mm -hmm. um, those would be the simple cues, and that's where you would start. 
Okay. So right away, I've just given you specifics. Yeah. yeah. Okay? It's not just your, your ability to adduct the, the, the hip that's going to determine what you're going to do. It's not just your, your ability to extend the hip uh, um, versus yeah. gravity. Right. Think about the diaphragm position first, because if I don't have that, everything else is useless and not all the activities are created equal. Okay. Thank you for that. That's a, that's a great, that's a great answer. Cause when I think about it, so much of the complexity has to do with yeah, hip adduction, hip external rotation. You know, that's kind of just like, but see, but see that, but those tests exist because the diaphragm is malpositioned. The question then becomes what position is the diaphragm in? And then that determines what your first activity will be. Yes. And so the more accurate you are, with your first activity, the bigger bang you get. So, so, um, and, and again, so this is, this was done through, um, study outside. So, so Lance made me study a bunch of stuff about respiration once. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I blame him. It's true, it, was, I it, did. Was best, it was the best thing that we ever did actually. Um, cause it cleared up a lot of, lot of confusion and then it, it redirected a lot of thought because the deeper you go into the respiratory function of the thorax, um, the more you'll understand that what you were taught in school is wrong. <laughs> and then you'll also gain uh, an appreciation for the subtlety of the mechanics. And then that helps you determine what exercises you need to use because now you'll be able to identify, okay, air is supposed to go in here, but if it's not going in here, then I have a problem. So it's, it's like a compensatory activity that you would measure with an extremity. Mm -hmm. So when you get a whole bunch of like, uh, hip external rotation that shouldn't be there and you go oh somebody blew out a ligament or whatever right um so now i see this this compensatory activity in thorax and now i go oh that's not supposed to be that way so i need to make that, that better so how do i do that and that's my exercise choice yeah okay yeah do it so, so go back and and pick up a book like um uh, Flynn's thorax. Hang on. It's uh, thoracic spine and rib cage by Flynn. I think is it Flynn? I can't remember the author. It's the thoracic. It is Flynn. Is it Flynn? So that's a cute little book. Lee. Diane Lee. Diane Lee. Thank you. Um, her thorax book is really, really good in regards to the mechanics. So the first half of the book is about mechanics. The second half is about um, evaluation and treatment, which is like, nah. I just didn't like the second half of her book. I, I don't, I don't, um, I don't evaluate the same way that she does and I don't treat the same way she does. So um, I just, I, again, the, the return on investment that, that I see on, on the, the detail that, that she goes into um, via palpation is, is for me is kind of useless because I don't think it works, but that's my opinion. Um, I'd be happy to talk to her in public about that, but you know, which book anyway, is this? What book? Yeah. Um, Diane Lee's, uh, uh, thorax book. It's really good. It's, it's, it's a really, I mean, she does a really good job. She's got a nice little, little model that she uses from an integrative standpoint, which I really, really like. Like I said, it's just the, the, the evaluation and treatment part. Treatment stuff. Um, okay. That I would disagree with. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time, Bill. Yeah. Ty, you got any questions? Oh, Patrick. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm really new to PRI, and I actually I found one of Bill's lectures, Understanding and Optimizing Movement and Performance. I found it online, went through that recently. I guess the question I had was, uh, if you if your athlete didn't have any symptoms, but he had the unilateral or bilateral extension pattern. Yep. How do you know when to intervene and pattern that out? Or, um, or go ahead. Yeah, no, okay. So, so we have to talk about different types of athletes a little bit here, right? So not all athletes are created equal. But, um, you have to kind of consider demands, right? So um, the, the, the comparison that I always use is because we, we, we've seen this time and time again, if I have a, a, a straight ahead sprinter, so like a hundred meter sprinter, and if I have a soccer player, right. Mm -hmm. And, and they may walk in the door and present exactly the same as far as my measurements go. Right. And in one case, I'm going to go, cool. That's exactly what I want. In the other case I might go, Ooh, that's not good. Right. Mm -hmm. So I have to kind of consider the environment that they function in. Right. And, and, 
and so the demands of what they're facing and then how much variability in the entire system do I need? And so when I talk about variability, it's like, okay, so I could talk about variability of energy systems. Okay. I could talk about variability of movement um, amongst other things, but we'll stick to those because they're easier to identify and, and to, uh, to discuss. So if, if I look at a straight head, so a hundred meter sprinter versus a, a soccer player. So which, which energy system do you think the 100 meter sprinter is going to spend most of his time in? 100 meter, the glycolytic, or anaerobic. Not even, not even glycolytic. He's not, he's not going to run long enough to do that. He's going to go 100 meters, so 10 seconds. So he may, he may cross into that for like half a second. I don't know. It all depends on who we're talking about. But so the creatine phosphate, phosphate. Yeah, phase. exactly. So, so how much variability of energy systems does he really need? Almost none, right? Yeah. He's got one and, and, you know, so I would never have him run repeat miles or anything like that because that would be kind of ridiculous to, to develop that type of aerobics. So the, the way that a sprinter develops his, his aerobic capacity and his ability to recover, um, if you read Charlie Francis's materials, um, so he'll talk about his high low system and, mm. and tempo sprints, the tempo runs, which are, are low intensity runs about 70, 75%. And that's how they develop their aerobic capacity uh, as sprinters, because they just don't need much. Whereas my soccer player is going to go through, you know, ATP, TP, he's going to be glycolytic, he's going to be aerobic, all depending on what he's doing at the time during a match, right? Mm -hmm. So I need broader scope of variability from an energy standpoint alone. So just looking at the, those aspects, right? So if I have like a, a hundred meter sprinter that's, you know, medium qualification, and you find out that he's got this tremendous aerobic activity or, or capacity, then maybe he's been trained wrong and that's what's slowing him down because now he has too much variability in his energy systems. Whereas I see the same thing in a soccer player and I'm going, yay, cool, awesome. So if we look at movement perspective, what are the demands of a, of a hundred meter sprinter? I go in a straight line, okay? There's no defense. Although it would be really interesting if there was, if you ask me, I think 100 meters would be really interesting if they had to like dodge something on the way there. <laughs> but but, but so, so it's very, very predictable, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they even paint the white lines on the ground so he knows exactly where he needs to go. He knows where the tape is at the end of the, uh, of the race. And so there's, there's, there's no guesswork, right? He knows exactly where he needs to be. Well, I want a guy that's lined up to run in a straight line, which would be a bilateral extension pattern, right? Because mm -hmm. what does it do? It steals my ability to move in the frontal plane. It steals my ability to move into transverse plane, which means it takes very little energy for me to control those other planes, which means I can propel myself straight forward, which gives me an advantage as a sprinter, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm a soccer player, now I have to know where I am on the field. I have to know where everybody else is on the field. And I have to change directions constantly. I have to ch I have to accelerate, decelerate, right? So I need a much higher level of variability in my ability to move, right? So if I get a guy that comes in and he's bilaterally extended and he's got limited internal external rotation anywhere, if he can't control his frontal plane, now I have a problem. Does that kind of make sense? Do you see the yeah. difference in in mm -hmm. perspective? So I can't just lump everybody in and say, oh, it's better to be this because I don't know. And then I can narrow it even more and I can say, okay, so I got a sprinter that comes in and he's got 25 degrees of hip internal rotation. Maybe he's faster if I steal some of that and I knock it down to 15, right? Mm -hmm. And so I extend him even more. Yeah, Oops, yeah. nobody ever talks about that part, right? Because <laughs> what if it, because I'm talking about performance, I'm not talking about health. There's a, there's yeah, a yeah. distinct difference when I'm talking about the health of an individual versus versus performance of an individual because I'm not really con I mean I don't want people to get hurt obviously from a performance standpoint but the difference between what what uh, Stephen and I do as as physical therapy you're, you're a PT student I'm actually a applied exercise science student oh, okay so I'm more into the coaching okay. sports performance route gotcha so, so, uh, uh, so what Stephen and I do as physical therapists is we have to broaden variability for health purposes, okay? Mm -hmm. Whereas when we train for performance, we have to narrow variability intentionally to, to achieve a very specific level of physiology that allows them to perform at the highest level under very specific circumstances, okay. right? 
mm-hmm. which, which compromises health under many circumstances, right? You know, if I want to be the world's best shot putter, I got news for you. My heart rate variability ain't going to be very high. Yeah. Right? Okay. But I have to have high levels of power output. I have to have a, a amazing pressure control of my, of my trunk and my, and my pelvis, right? So it behooves me to have a big, wide body, right, that's thick and round, because now I can create more pressure behind the, the throw. Whereas if I'm a high jumper or something like that, obviously I have to have a different, different body type and so on and so forth. So, so consider the environment that they're gonna function in, the task they have to perform, and then look at the human and say, okay, does this match up? And then people don't like to say this, you still don't know what the right answer is, okay? Because you have to tweak and you have to trial and error. And, and so when we're dealing with humans, humans are complex adaptive systems, which means that it's a system that can change itself, all right? And it can, it can adapt under certain circumstances, but you don't know how it's going to adapt. So you, do you understand the concept of a butterfly effect? Mm-hmm. So a very small input could have a great big impact or mm-hmm. it could have no impact or it could have a very small impact and then a very large input could have a very small impact or a very large impact or no impact at all. The same input could have impact at one point in time and have a totally different impact in another. So, so humans are unpredictable in that manner. So you have to take that into consideration too. So while you might think you know what to do every time, it doesn't always work. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so from a general concept, you go back to task, you go back to environment, you go back to the human and then you start tweaking. Hey Bill. Yes. Um, Going back to your bilateral extension, like we've got the straight ahead, you know, linear athlete. uh, Uh, Could you make the case then that doing bilateral lifts in a, in a weight room would be, you know, obviously be more beneficial to that athlete because it's, it's, you know, has a better chance of locking them into that sagittal plane that they're already in right they don't have plane and transverse plane capabilities. So if you take them out of that bilateral extension pattern, like in a split squat or something like that and make them closer, more unilateral or less bilateral, I guess is a better way of saying it. Yeah. Um, putting them, you know, in, in, in a pool they can't swim in, uh, essentially. Yeah. No. Is so, yeah, it, it is. But, but, but let's look at it. Let's look at the, um, what the true intent is okay so the true intent of a bilateral exercise compared to a unilateral exercise or a split stance exercise is to generate the maximum neural output possible that's why you do those activities right because you that's that's also top end speed sprinting too say what now i mean like like max in effort is also top end sprinting right i mean there's Right. So, so do you remember when Derek was talking about, about why when you, when, when you work on linear speed with, with any athlete that everything kind of gets better because what that does, that that's one of the highest force outputs that you'll ever generate is your top end speed regardless of how fast you are. And so what you're doing is you're training the nervous system to, to output as much neural energy as you are capable of doing. So, so by doing that, you desensitize your system to allow you to generate a higher and higher potential output each time you do that. So when we do a bilateral exercise, we're not trying to extend someone, right? Right. We're trying to teach them to put out more energy. And then as in doing so, the system has to simplify itself to generate that output and therefore the result. Result is extension. So we're not te- we're not trying to extend people. It is a byproduct of the technique you know, right. to, to, to generate the neural output. Does that right. make sense? No, absolutely. And, I, and I'm I'm with you on that. When you say desensitize, you, I mean yeah. you're talking about the inhibitory mechanisms in the body where we're absolutely not to be so sensitive. Absolutely. How do you take the brakes off? So so you know it's just like when 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 you start a newbie and it's like how do they get strong, right? There's this there's this this infinitesimally small amount of hypertrophy from the get go. We know that, right? But what really happens are the neural the neural changes are what really accelerates the early phases of strength. Well, what are you doing? You're just taking the brakes off because mm-hmm. you're not changing the. The, the, the peripheral structure to a, a enough degree that would, that would show these dramatic changes in strength, right? So the nervous system is becoming more efficient because 
The nervous system going, okay, um, how do I protect myself against this next time? All right, I need to output more energy to protect myself. Well, how do I protect myself? Well, I simplify the system. Well, how do I simplify the system? Well, you shift yourself forward in the sagittal plane, and now we've reduced the degrees of freedom, so now I can generate more output. So it's, it becomes like this cyclical kind of a thing, right? Then the question becomes like, okay, how much of this do I need, right? And then that, that, that's determined through, um, for lack of a better term, trial and error. Obviously, it's, it's programming and, and results, but, but that's literally what it becomes, and that's perfectly acceptable with a complex scenario with a human. Um, so are these concepts of pressure management, do they all stem from PRA? Say what? The concepts of the pressure management and um, do they all stem from PRI? No. Yeah, because Leo was telling me that you had a really good uh, definition of stability as pressure management and joint compression. So, so there's only one mechanism that the human body can use to stabilize a joint, and that's compression, mm -hmm. right? So how you achieve that determines whether um, you, you retain the ability to move um, or not move or whether you're um, loading a structure that you don't want to load. Um, and again, that, that's going to come down to, uh, you know, the experience of the human, the task that you're doing in the environment that you're doing in. And, and some things are totally acceptable and sometimes they're not acceptable. So, you know, impingement is acceptable under some circumstances, right? And in other circumstances, it's not, right? Because sometimes impingement doesn't hurt. But it provides a hell of a lot of stability if I got to do something, you know, under a massive load. So, you know, I'll guarantee you that, that most super heavyweight powerlifters that are competing in the highest level of contests are using impingement to drive stability, to allow them to lift heavier weights with the understanding that there are consequences to that, right? Not what I would choose for my day-to-day my -day general pop clients, right? Um, but again, under certain circumstances, it's got to be acceptable as long as you weigh the, the, the risks and the, the benefits and understand what the outcome will be. How do you find that intersection of maximizing performance and while still minimizing their injury risk? Um, again, it, it, we, we always talk about N equals one, right? So, so we do a pretty extensive evaluation. So we try to get to know this person as much as we can. We track the, all the changes that, that, um, that we can um, use all the information that we have available. Like, you know, Ty and Tony have obviously um, set some standards as far as um, using you know, the force outputs and, and velocity based, based training that are very effective in regards to, to um, how we want to make changes in, in the athletes. And then we monitor, we reevaluate, we see what happens. Like, okay, the, the performance increase, and then what happened to the rest of them, right? So if, if I put four inches on a guy's vertical jump, did I, did I steal some of his hip mobility to do that, right? Is that okay under these circumstances? Well, under, what, under what environment does he have to perform? Um, and does this affect that, right? Um, if, I, if, I, if I see somebody consistently losing the variability that I'm trying to instill, then I need to start reevaluating my process. Right. Cause I, I don't want to create an injury. That would, that would be horrible. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, I, I can't give you like this absolute, I think that, that it's, it's a matter of having enough measures and enough understanding. And then, um, you have to do what we call safe to fail experiments. Um, not fail safe, but safe to fail. So if, if I experiment with somebody, um, I have to be assured that, that, um, as we go through the process that I will not put them at, at a high risk um, for, for an injury. Um, and then I, I can still evaluate the outcome to see if it was favorable or not. Because a lot of times, you know, and you've probably done this already at some point in time, you put two people on the same program and you get two different outcomes. Like, like one guy makes great progress and the other guy is just totally stagnant because you just don't know, right? Um, but as long as is execution of the program is safe, then you're okay. Then you just say, okay, so this guy needs a different type of a stimulus than the other guy did, right? So, and you have to be, you have to accept that fact. It's like people want these absolutes, and I always talk about this, but people want absolutes. They want rights and wrongs, and, and we're dealing with 
such complexity in regards to humans that you just can't, you can't do that. You have to be willing to accept the fact that I have no idea what's going to happen. I have an intent, right? Based on what I understand from a physiology standpoint and what my experience tells me and what the client offers, right? So, so, so I, I definitely go in with an intent, but I have no idea what the outcome is going to be. Hey, Patrick, Patrick, just to pile on top of Bill, like, um, I don't know where you're at and, and everybody's at a different point, but for me, how I go through that is, is, you know, over time and experience and seeing reps, you develop a model for, let's say a squat, how that should look. And then you get to know your athlete. So Bill, like, I'm, like Bill said, the, your experience coming in and then you kind of have to know that like, you know, one athlete can go, you can, can get away with a little bit more than another athlete. And so just, I'm just piling on, just reiterating and maybe some different words. Uh, what Bill's saying is every athlete is different. I don't know that you can have an overarching model for everybody, but you have to use your model for movement as your basis. At least that's what I think on the floor. Right. And then uh, over time develop how much willingness you're, you know, you're, you're able to go away from that model as they, as you're increasing load and things like that. Now we always want every squat rep to be perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. or push up or whatever, but that's not always, you know, if I'm trying to push for a one rep max or, or doing something as fast as I can, you know, perfect is not always going to be there. Right. So, and, and so, so Ty brings up a really, a really, really good um, uh, point in regards to, to the model. It's like whatever model you have right now, Patrick, um, it's the right one. So, so, it, and that, so it's okay. Whatever you're doing is actually okay. As long as you follow a few simple rules and, and that the, the first rule in, in regards to anything that you apply is that it is safe to fail. So, so if you err on the side of caution under every circumstance, you will be safe. So I don't care what, what three letter acronym system you follow or four ac letter acronym system you follow. Or I don't care how you evaluate movement and I don't care what system you use to program within, within that framework, you have to have a, a decision-making process and then you have to have an execution process that all fall into, to these, these um, safe and, and adequate ranges that you can control and then determine whether you have a successful outcome or not. Right. It doesn't matter because everybody's at a different place. Right. So I don't expect, how old are you, Patrick? I'm 27. Okay. So you're a baby. All right, cool. So, so I'm twice as old as you almost. All right. You look, you little, look this, twice as old. You look like huh? you're 30. I know. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just keep doing this. I just keep pulling the face. No. Um, thank you very much. But I, I, in person, I look ancient. I see um, everyone shaking their head. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Um, but that's why I keep young people around me, Patrick. It, it keeps, but but so so I've been alive almost twice as long as you, all right? And I've been exposed to more information than you have, although you have a tremendous benefit um, that you're benefiting from every, everyone else's hindsight in everything that you're learning. Um, but, I, but I've been exposed to more stuff and I've had more failures than you have. And so when, when somebody asks me a question, a lot of times my first answer is, well, it depends. Give me more information because I have more it depends than you do, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that's why I say wherever you are and whatever you know and whatever system that you're using, I'm okay with that because it's not wrong as long as you have a decision-making process and a way to execute safely. Um, it's, it's when you go off the bet, that beaten path that you run into trouble. Now, the caveat of that is, if you marry yourself to a single system, you will fail. You will stop learning. And um, you, you, one, you'll become dissatisfied with what you're trying to accomplish because there is so much more available to you. There is not a single model in the entire world that is representative of the human system other than the human system itself. And then if we are all unique to, to some degree, then everyone is their own N equals one, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to accept the fact that there's gonna be a lot of unknowns and there's a lot of complexity that you will never know. So when I have patients get better, okay? And it happens a lot, okay? Cause we've gotten pretty good at what we do. I have no idea why they got better, okay? 
I, and I'm, I'm dead serious. I have no idea. I know what my intent was, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I know what my measurements can tell me in regards to success, but ultimately I have no idea. Because it, it might be the shirt that I wore that day that they really like. And maybe that's why they felt better. I'm serious. I'm dead yeah. serious. I totally, yeah, I totally maybe, agree. Maybe it's the way I shake hands when they first walk in the door. Or maybe it's the fact that I smile at them when I first meet them, right? Or maybe, maybe it's a joke that I tell. Or maybe it's the actual treatment. I don't know. I really don't know. And nobody else does either. And anybody that takes credit <laughs> for, for a patient getting better other than the patient themselves. I mean, we're guides. We're interactors. You know, we don't fix anybody, right? So... To make a long story short, um, be okay with where you're at, always get better, read outside of where you are right now, and then go to the next course, and then the next one, and then buy the next book, and, and start asking yourself questions. Okay, how does this compare to what I already know? Does this make me want to change something and if i do change it how can i make the smallest measurable change right without putting people at risk and, and just do that progressively over time just keep asking yourself the same thing over and over and over again because you're not going to you're never going to know <laughs> i mean you know if you can accept that fact and then keep learning and keep trying and then and keep safely experimenting you're going to be fine yeah thanks for that yeah as i keep learning and learning i realize like that really know that the less I know, the more I learn, the less I realize that I know. John, talk to me in 25 years, will you? <laughs> we'll have a nice little sit down. I'll be at the home in my rocking chair. You know, Tony's going to still be bringing me food. <laughs> and uh, we'll have that conversation and, I, and, and you'll still tell me the same thing 25 years from now. Okay, oh, but it'll feel worse because you're going to have the realization that you're not going to know enough before you die. Okay. Cause that's where I'm at right now. It's like, okay, you know, I only got 100, 120, 130 more years to go here and there's no way I can learn everything in time. Lance just you know? messaged me. Ha 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 ha. Oh God. I have one last question. So, uh, um, as I guess, like, as I continue to build my toolbox, I'm currently reading Super Training. I, I want to read Tony and Ty's book next. Tony just sent it to me. Mm -hmm. um, I guess after that, I read, I reread How to Win Friends and Influence People after you give me your advice. Yes. What, uh, what do you recommend next to get into? Um, I would stop reading Super Training right now <laughs> unless, unless you need to take a nap. <laughs> it's really tough. It's been tough to read. I just I, I want to stop. <laughs> I highly recommend that you go straight to the uh, so chapter six is on programming, uh -huh. right? So you go to chapter six and go to like six point two because the first part's like nothing, <laughs> um, and then take a little nap, and then when you get up from a nap, read something that's a little bit more understandable that has some examples in. I yeah, love it's it. really complicated. It, it, it is, but that's because Mel Sip was complicated and he wrote most of it. So, um, <laughs> you know, the, the thing that I keep telling people is that, you know, the, the, the true model is human physiology and you need to read more of that. You need to understand more of that. So you understand like, what are the potential things that are actually happening? So the thing that I do now is uh, I spend more time looking at how each system affects the other. Um, you know, it, when we look at uh, like stress science alone, look at the hormonal cascade of stress science. Um, and then that gives you a little bit of a window as to what every other system is going to respond with. So the immune system responds to that and the movement system responds to that. So you get all these cool little changes. And the more you understand about the integration of systems, um, the more intelligently you can speak about why you made a selection versus I went to this course and they did this really cool exercise that I'm going to do on Monday because it was really hard. Um, whereas now you can say, well, my goal is to whatever it might be. So like, why would I choose a bilateral exercise? We've talked about that today. 
well, I need to ramp up the, the, the force output so that the amount of neural output that I'm generating helps me take the restrictor plates off. So now I'll see a side benefit. So um, when you actually make somebody stronger in the weight room, that strength doesn't translate to anything that they do. But the ability to generate the neural output is what you're going to see demonstrated on the field or on the court. So again, that's how you make those kinds of decisions. So when people talk about well, I'm going to do a single leg activity because you spend most of your time on a single leg. Um, if you're not duplicating the kinetics, um, there's not really a, a, a transfer in that regard. And you're also lowering the neural output because now I have to distribute load amongst um, any number of variables. So if I have 100 units of, of neural output and I'm doing a single leg activity, I have to control three planes all at once. Plus, I have to generate force production, energy production, and then monitor feedback and feed forward. So now I've just distributed all that neural energy across that. Whereas if I do a bilateral exercise that doesn't require as much um, neuromuscular control, now I can generate more force output and learn how to generate more force across the, the entire spectrum of performance. So again, that's how you make those kind of decisions. And See that you don't agree with Mike Boyle then. How's that? Oh, the, Mike's he's, pretty smart, huh? it's, all right, I know he's really into the unilateral loading. Like the single yeah. leg squatting. Hey, we do stuff like that too. We just don't make everything that way, right? Got it. Mike does bilateral stuff, right? Yeah. You know? So looking into, I guess, then looking into more on the human physiology first. Yeah, so, so, so strengthen that foundation because everything that you'll ever learn is based off of that. So the weaker, so, so if, if you're, if you're, scope of knowledge is is the, the the base of your scope of knowledge is is physiology but it's the point instead of the, the the base right so i want physiology down here i want the most there and then i stack specific stuff on top if it's inverted and that's that's all the physiology they know then here's what's going to happen to you and this is a horrible thing by the way is that every time somebody says something to you you have to believe them so i could be totally full of shit Okay. And I'm as full of shit as anyone else. Okay. I am because I'm a human. Right. But if I tell you something, if I tell you that um, rhinoceros poop is the most powerful performance enhancing drug in the world, and it'll put 12 inches on your vertical jump and, and you don't have a counter argument against that, you have to be the guy with the garbage bag out at the zoo trying to break into the rhino cage, right? So you can get your dose. Mm -hmm. Seriously, right? So I don't want anybody to be that person. So your strength will be in the foundational sciences. So, so build, so, so what, what's the, uh, who's the author of the uh, white physiology book, Ty Tarot? McDougall. Is it McDougall? So get McDougall's uh, Physiology of High Performance. Physiology of High Performance. So, yep. Patrick, I use super training as a, as a reference. It's, it's, it's like an encyclopedia. You don't go read a whole encyclopedia. <laughs> it's something you go reference. Yeah, uh, yeah. I use it's something like to McDougall read. to educate me, like the white book to educate me. So that's yeah, just yeah. – and I, and I had to learn like – if you re, if you do what Bill's saying, and I and I think his point needs to be, re, I wish ten times more people were on this because we all need to hear that point because that is the only thing that's going to give us a deeper understanding and answer to the question why when when something in the in the weight room is presented in front of us. If you don't know physiology, and I don't know a lot of it, I'm 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 fine, but but damn, if you know physiology, you have answers. Got it. I'm going to pick that up after this then. I think that's the same book Tony would recommend this to me too. He said it's his favorite. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice little book. Good read. Uh, he, he'll probably send that to you too, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. I'm a huge fan of you guys. You too, Ty. You and Lee. I've been looking into a lot of Lee Taft's work lately also. Never heard of Lee. Exactly. Who's this guy? Never heard of him. Who's Lee Taft? <laughs> <laughs> that guy probably still owes my mom child support. <laughs> Uh, sorry, sorry for hogging the mic. 
No, no, it was no, good you're good, Patrick. Good that, uh, so I, I wanted to make that point that you made, Bill, like 30 minutes ago when you started talking about it. But over the, you guys, just for you guys, I know Ty and Bill already know, but over the last year, we've done a lot of just basic science videos because that helps you form your model. And then you can start to, you can, you can think it fits into anyone's model. And then you can start to call bullshit on rhino poop. We should make a shirt out of that one. I uh, hope that sticks. <laughs> just have two syringes and then like a rhinoceros in the middle. <laughs> How about we do one more question if anybody's got one? Yeah, if you're good. I'm way past got one? I have I'm a minutes past well, my bedtime. Jake, let's hear it. All right, I was thinking, t talk about vision and the effects on like performance. Um, I was also thinking uh, state of arousal for performance. So it might be the same thing. It might be um, perfect for like a warm up kind of thing. Okay. To butt and kick ass. And I'm also in a hotel room. So I'm, I've been looking at this thing. It's like the molding fell off of his bed. I think someone was nice. getting after it. So it wasn't me. Is it Motel 6? Uh, no, it's worse than that. A... <laughs> then I got three hotel Nice in? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> right. Is that where the state of arousal question came from? So, yes. so what, I, what, what, what's the whole question again? Because, because I'm, um, I'm, I think you cut it out. Yeah. Yeah. So it, um, just talk about like vision and, and, you know, just where would you start? Cause I don't know enough. You mean like eyes ask. vision? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, eyes. Okay. So like it's a big part of our systems, right? Like, it, so we yeah. get all this information I know enough about it to ask a really good question. I, I kind of wanted to know where I should start looking into more of that kind of stuff. Um, so there's a couple of, of books on, on sports vision um, that, are, that are actually pretty decent. Um, I'd have, I have to leave the, the computer for a second. I can get you titles. Can I do that? Is, would that be rude of me to walk over to my other bookshelf? It's on the other side of the, the house. Nah, do it. Okay. No, the back cave. I'll just I'll bring you with me. How about that? So the light might change a little bit. Pretty sure this is how the Blair Witch Project started. All right. Are you going to show them your library? Oh, you want to see the light? No, this is just one shelf. This is just one little shelf. It's dark over here, so I apologize. Um, hang on a minute. I got to find it. Um, C to play is one book. Um, vision and goal directed movement. Oh, where's the other one? Oh, here we go. Um, if you really want to learn about like, like vision in the nervous system, Is it backwards? No. Etiology no. of vision disorders. Um, this is like a, a good nervous system book in general. And then third vision book would be perception, cognition, and decision training. Okay. And that has, a, that has like, uh, you know, uh, brain processing stuff in a, in a, it's actually in a pretty easy to understand um, language. Um, Nick Winkleman has done some stuff on decision training. I think, I think it was Nick. I might be wrong on that, but I think it was Nick. And, and so there's some foundational stuff in there too. But that's what I would do is it's just get a general understanding. Um, as far as how you're going to influence it, I would say that there's, we could, we could spend all day kind of talking about possibilities, but I think it's just one of those things that's so up in the air as to how we actually influence it. But um, understand a couple of things just because of uh, like uh, the way that our peripersonal space or our space around us, you know, uh, works. It's, it's a right dominant peripersonal space. So people tend to have um, more difficulty accessing a left visual field. So we'll spend a little bit of time working on that with some people. 
I don't spend a lot of time working on vision directly. Um, one, because I'm not an optometrist, but, uh, but I can identify a couple of things. And so you'll see like, um, um, you know, if you ever do like a, a right, right leg balance, left, left leg balance kind of a thing on, on anybody, like just a static balance test, um, which doesn't have a lot of carryover to a lot of stuff. But, but if you reorient the eyes while they're in single leg stance, you'll see a difference in the two sides. And so that just might give you an opportunity to say, okay, okay we're going to do a little bit more left side oriented visual field work um, just to give them a little bit more variability in their system. Right. And in doing so, you'll see changes in, in like, you know, extremity mobility um, as well. Um, but I wouldn't spend like a tremendous amount of time on, on things like that because a lot of that is just so specific in regards to the task involved. So, and you'll see all sorts of these, these silly little drills of like, um, you know, the balls with like the numbers and letters on, they throw it and they say, okay, catch the ball and then tell me what the letter is. So you learn to look the ball into your hand. Well, here's the nasty little secret about that is that you actually stop tracking the ball about three feet before you catch it. And then you, your brain anticipates where the ball is going to go. And then that puts your hand in that place. So you never actually watch the ball into your hands. Like when you're watching the NFL game of the week and they say, oh, look, he looked away and that's why he dropped the ball. No, he looked away because that's what he does every every time he catches a ball. So, you know, I wish I could give you like this really, really simple answer of what to do, but what I would say is just, just get an understanding of how, how vision influences a lot of different things and get a little bit of background on it because it's, it's infinite as to what direction we can go. And, and I learned that one the hard way, you know, you think you, you, you go to a silly little course and you think you know something about it, but there's, there's just too much to learn unless you're going to spend, you know, spend all of your time doing that. Um, you know, and, and so maybe just the visual bias would be something that you can build into a warm up. Do something over here and say, "Hey, attend to this," right? Um, you know, uh, especially with like a court player who needs the broader visual field, or or if, you know, like again, I always refer to soccer players because we had them in, in our place all the time. They just need this broad spectrum of vision, right? And so if they don't access their left side as much then, um, you know, maybe you're creating a performance deficit that shows up on the field. But, um, but start with those books. They're, they're, they're easy to read. Um, they're very informative. I don't know if they'll, they'll affect your decision making all that much, but it'll give you some sort of like a, a background that you can probably have a really good conversation with somebody that knows a lot about it. Um, so start there. What was the other part? The arousal thing? Yeah. Should we drive some sympathetic um, dominance before a, an event? But I've seen people do like like power postures and stuff to try to like get them into like sure ready for like stand like Wonder Woman. A, yeah, yeah. Um, well, okay, so so, so I, I go ahead, go ahead. I was I trained X racers, so like we're like it's like hundred meter sprinters, but then you you're jumping over jumps and you're crashing into each other on corners and stuff. So. You know, I think you have to have a good blend of, um, you know, with everything. It, it's, it's, you have to be able to sprint, but you also have to be able to turn. And like what you're talking about with 100-meter sprinters before, right. you know, it's just straight ahead. It's just straight ahead, but you have to judge distances. You have to turn left and you have to turn right. And you have to navigate people trying to run into. Right. So, so, so let me offer you this. Um, say that I am the uh, strength and conditioning coach for the New England Patriots. Oh, oh, wait, I almost threw up in my mouth. Um, so I, and I'm working with offensive linemen and Tom Brady. Um, who do I want to be more aroused, you know, from a thought process standpoint? And who needs to have more variability in their thought processes, you know, in that group? It's going to be Tom Brady, obviously, right? So I want Tom Brady to be cool, calm, and collected as much as I can. And then I want my offensive linemen, who basically take two steps and get in a fight on a regular basis, I need them to be very, very aroused, right? Because the demands upon them are much greater from a neural, neural energy output from a physical standpoint. Um, so, so I think you kind of match that, kind of like we were talking with uh, Patrick earlier. I, was it Patrick, I think, when we were talking about soccer versus the sprinters? It's like, it's like okay, I got to know this guy. Like some people are going are gonna to function when they're very, very aroused, and some people will not. 
Um, and then there's the, the concept of, are you familiar with like amygdala hijack, that kind of a concept? So your amygdala is, is the, the little part of your brain that, that tends to, to um, protect you against dangerous things. And so they, they always, they, they point to it when we, they talk about fear or, or protection. And um, so the comparison that I always made is like, so the difference between Peyton Manning and, and Tom Brady um, is that, is that um, you know, if, if Peyton Manning uh, has a bad game, he would rather kill himself than lose. And Tom Brady goes, yeah, well, we lost, but, you know, I'm married to a supermodel and I got all this money and we'll eventually win another Super Bowl. And so he's kind of laid back and calm and cool. Whereas Peyton is, is he is, is like, if I'm in a situation where I'm about to, to lose, I have to do something incredibly stupid to try to win this game. And that's where he makes the mistake. So his amygdala sort of takes over where he's in these, these fear-based patterns where Tom Brady's just like, eh, you know, whatever. So again, you have to kind of look at arousal from, from the perspective, okay, what are the needs of the, of the human in the environment? Um, and then, okay, what is optimized? And then hopefully you've got enough time to develop the experience with that human. And then, you know, right. Okay. So I need this much arousal. Right. And then one of the ways you can kind of tell it's like, and again, going back to this, this concept of, of neural output, it's like, okay, what, what do I expect under high levels of arousal from a mobility standpoint? What would I expect? <clears throat> I should expect the human movement system to simplify itself just like every other, other system, right? So, so if I'm aroused, what happens to my blood pressure? It increases and it stabilizes at whatever level I need to be at, right? So it becomes rigid, less variable, right? It doesn't go up and down. It stays high. Um, so I would expect muscle tone to do the same thing, right? So I would expect to see a loss of mobility. Well, how much? I don't know, but maybe you can figure that out for your guy, right? And then if you want to wrap in vision with this, then you can say, well, guess what? It's going to affect his visual field too, right? So he's going to become more focal, most likely, right? If he's, if he's you know, defensive and protective, he will become more focal. So he loses let, loses more of the field so he, so he becomes narrowed so maybe this guy just needs more experience under under uh, stressful circumstances to allow him to learn how to adjust his visual field under those circumstances to allow him to adjust his mobility under those circumstances so as with all of my answers i suppose there's not like this really cool absolute right wrong it's all gray to me you know you just have to understand what the inputs are how those inputs affect the system and then what your potential outputs can tell you. So thank you. I don't know if that was a good answer or not, but. No, <laughs> I'm just joking. It was good. Thank you. Welcome. All right. Is everybody tired? I am. How okay. are you? Um, we should probably wrap. That's probably a good call. Rufus at the beat. Tony's still at work. Yes, I am. Dude's got to go home. He doesn't want to. <laughs> Is it me? <laughs> <laughs> We're roommates, FYI. That's why. <laughs> Who's the big spoon? <laughs> <At the arms. laughs> oh, All right, guys. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, uh... Thanks for being here. I yeah, thank you for your time, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. You're very welcome. Yeah, I thanks, took a guys. bunch of crappy notes yeah. that I can upload for you guys. Um, any final thoughts, Bill? Um, I wanted to ask Campo how is school. I got a quiz tomorrow on the axilla, the brachium, and the anterior forearm. So nice. Just got done with a 10 hour study day. So I get to go do more flashcards and pass out. I am oh glistening because of it. So I'm, I'm you, are, you are sweating go. really heavily. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. I know. Almost yeah. done. Got two week and a half and then we're done with anatomy. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. I got news for you. Well, <laughs> anatomy. Simmons is done with anatomy. I'm not done with anatomy. How about that? There you go. That a boy.
I like that answer a lot better. Cool. All right. Keep it up. Working on it. Don't let me down. I won't. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for being Thanks here. Again, Bill. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Good to see you.